I know you're strong. Hi, I'm Joe Iconis, and this is my co-host. Jennifer Ashley Tepper. Today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about a song that Joe wrote in 2010 called The Protector, as sung by the great Jason Sweet Tooth Williams. This song pays tribute to a state that's very near and dear to my heart. Indeed, uh, and it also holds the distinction of being the song that more than any other song on the album people have said is really creepy. That's quite an accomplishment. I'm proud of it. Uh, I clear my mind. I down scotch. God damn the Protector. It, yeah, when did you write The Protector? It was 2010? 2010. Yes. Yes, precisely. Yeah. I wrote this song with Jason Sweet Tooth Williams in mind. Um, and it's, you know, it's of, I feel like a lot of my songs are these character snapshots that have, have, have a very sort of um, clear setup. Like they're living in a clear space, uh, the characters, issue is is front and center and um, and it's kind of sort of easy to 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 understand exactly what's going on the protector is a song that I I kind of knew what it was about when I started writing it but I wanted to be intentionally vague and so it I think is kind of this weird sort of in-between song where it very much is a character song and it very much is a sort of portrait of of a man uh, but it is it is it is more purposefully vague insofar as what is literally going on than mm -hmm. a lot of the other songs yeah. on the album. Um, what kind of direction did you give to Jason about it, given that that was how you felt about the song? Um, I mean, you know, the, the collaboration that I have with Jason is, uh, it's one that it, we just, we like, we truly understand each other so deeply that he he tends to he just gets it you know so it's like I I remember I I, I sent him the song and then we met for a drink at Fusion which was a bar on Tenth Avenue right by Ars Nova that is long since closed but I remember us talking about the song and and him being so excited by it and just you know being like oh I think it means this and I think it means this and I think it means this and and um, and, it, and we were like we could talk about it like it was something that neither of us were involved with. You know what I mean? And so and he just he just sort of inherently got it. He got that it's that it's a guy who's um, you know who sees sees his own um, his own weaknesses or his own uh, demons in someone younger, and he's trying to like steer them away. And that was kind of all he needed to know to act the song. And then we just you know we talked about what it could what it could mean. Yeah. It, yeah. I get, I never thought of it this way because I don't think of, like, lyrics are not poetry, but it is in terms of the vagueness. It is, like, more akin to poetry than most mm -hmm. of your songs, yeah. especially in the end when you're, you know, the lyrics are listing different things and you can't quite figure out exactly how they fit into the story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, and, you know, when I, when I think of it, I think of, you know, the, the, the sort of literal language that gets used in the song, I think it, it establishes, I guess maybe really not till the, the end, but we're in a, you know, in a kitchen like late at night, and that's where I think the song takes place, in a house, I think. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, it's, and it's, I guess it's hard to talk about because of that, you know, it's like a song that because it is sort of intentionally vague, and I, I know what I, I know, you know, what I thought the scenario was, but I kind of don't want to, <clears throat> I don't even want to say it because I think it's, <clears throat> I think that it's, it's like, it really has nothing, it's none, of, it's none of my business how anyone interprets the song, you know, it really is like, it's meant to just kind of be what it is and whatever you think about the song is, is correct. Yeah. You know, whatever you take away from it is correct. And sometimes it's like, and I, when I think about the song, I think about, you know, when you're sort of learning how to write musical theater or when you're, you know, just someone who's, um, interested in music like when I was a young <clears throat> when I was a young man and and reading as much as I could about musicals and 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 you know listening to like interviews with the greats one of the things was always 
one of the things that seems so important, one of the things that felt like oh, you have to be able to do this in a musical is um, this idea of like, you should, you should be able to like sum up your musical in one sentence or, or you should, you should um, or what, what people would always ask like, what is the audience supposed to get from this, right? And I, and I always like pinged me because I always felt like, well, I, I think, you know, if you're, whether you're writing one song or a full musical, it should of course be clear and you should of course, you know, you should know what you're doing. But I do think that there are many musicals where audiences get different things from them depending on the person, you know? And I think that that's great. And I think that actually is the thing that, that is a hallmark of a great musical when mm -hmm. two audience members can have two different experiences from the same show. And so The Protector is like one of those songs to me, or, you know, it's like if we want to think of all these songs as mini musicals, it's one where I just feel like the, the strength of it is that it's not over explaining. The strength right. of it is that you can't talk about it in one sentence. And the strength of it is that two people can listen to it and have two totally different ideas mm -hmm. about what the thing is, is about. And that feels correct yeah. to me. I really think of kind of this song in this time of like 2010 as sort of a turning point in your writing songs for specific people and voices and like mm -hmm. maybe doing that a little more. Mm -hmm. I feel like around the time of like The Protector, you know, obviously other people can perform it, other people have performed it, but like writing a song on not just an actor's voice or like range, but mm -hmm. also their, you know, specific qualities and abilities and um, just that kind of, I always think of like Elaine Stritch and The Ladies Who Lunch of like, mm -hmm. how am I going to show what I want to say and like what an actor can do that only I know they can do and use all of those things to kind of like create a new piece. Um, I don't know, do you feel like that kind of started in 2010 at all? Yeah, it definitely started, it definitely started more in 2020, 2010. I think also just because I, you know, I, 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 by you know, 2010 I had had a few years of actually getting to work and make art with a lot of these actors who I, you know, still work with. And so I had always loved this idea of, of writing theater and, you know, writing songs for specific actors who I loved. And I, you know, so many of the artists who I idolized, like Robert Altman or Paul Thomas Anderson, they had this kind of stable of actors. And I always thought like, oh, that's such an amazing way to make art. I would, I would love to, to, you know, be lucky enough to do that in my career. And then I found myself having that, you know? And so then it was sort of like, it was kind of, you know, making good on the, the promise of <laughs> writing for actors. And, and I just kind of couldn't help it, you know? Yeah. And during that time, I really, I was very, uh, you know, very prolific and I was just writing a ton and it was inspiring to me mm -hmm. to have these people um, who I, I love so much and, you know, to be able to write to their abilities and their strengths and all that. It just um, sense. It also overlapped with, you know, The Protector obviously was written when, you know, Blood Song of Love was happening at Ars mm -hmm. Nova. And I think, if not the first, some of the first times The Protector was performed was in the Ars Nova penthouse during mm -hmm. their showgasm, like post-show yeah. concerts. Um, and I feel like almost probably everyone in Blood Song of Love had a song like this around that time, right before, during Blood Song, right mm -hmm. after, that was this kind of, yeah. oh, I like wrote this on you, yeah. even as you were also doing like a new musical with yeah. those folks. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, and that also, I think it's just, you know, as we talked about, like, I just love actors. I love what they can do. And I love, you know, I love exploiting all the different shades of their talent. And I think that I think that probably one of the reasons why I, I did end up writing so much for the that Blood Song cast was because I was getting to, you know, work with them every day making a musical and I I was so excited by their performances in that musical, but it's like, you know, someone in a musical can only do so much. Right. Like, it's like you can't, you know, show every side of every person in a musical and I think I just whether I knew it or not, wanted more, you know? So yeah. it's like, and I guess the songs that I kind of wrote for people, you know, whether it was like Party Hat or... or um, Was Dirty Little Things around Dirty that Dirty Little time? Things, yeah. yeah. It's like I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to, to, uh, to make use of the person's talent and then give them something else to do, something mm -hmm. that they, that is kind of different from what they were doing in Blood Song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's like, there's quite a few songs on this album that would fall into that category. Maybe Norman also. Yeah, 100%, yeah. 100%. That was that exact time. 
I also have a lot of memories of our um, longtime stage manager, E. Sarah Barnes. Uh, like, she loves this song so much. And when you wrote this song, you told me, like, oh, you're going to have a reaction to some of the lyrics and the refrain. Like, it was the first <laughs> time you ever were like, you're going to have a reaction to this song. Um, so Sarah Barnes always, sorry, I guess, spoiler, calls this song in Florida and laughs a lot <laughs> in the audience when that song, that part of the song starts getting sung. Yeah. So everyone from Blood Song was just, like, very much part of these songs that were written at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, and yeah, how does the song make you feel as someone from Florida? I feel like maybe I understood immediately that it was like a kaleidoscope of different, it, it feels like a lot of different characters and I can very much picture them in Florida mm -hmm. because of the way that the song is written. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've like had a, I've almost felt like different people listening to the song over time because like I sometimes think it's about one thing and then I sometimes think it's about another thing. Mm -hmm all very much colored by my Floridian existence. <laughs> um, yeah, I love this song. Thanks. It also, uh, related to the like actor thing, I feel like it was around this time that like you and Jason taught me about the greatness that is Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. I actually, like being someone who hadn't seen a lot of his movies other than maybe Almost Famous, um, I kind of started to understand more of like how you wanted to um, in like embody the movie world for the musical theater mm -hmm. world from like learning about him. I, I don't know, like I don't, I guess in, if Philip Seymour Hoffman was a musical theater actor, he could have sung this song is where I'm going with this. 100%. Like, this is kind of like a Philip Seymour Hoffman song. Like a hundred percent. And when, you know, and I always like, I frequently said that Jason Sweetie Williams is my Philip Seymour Hoffman, right. you know? And, um, and this is like the most like Philip Seymour Hoffman-esque song. I, I love that you said that because I do think it is like weirdly um, infused with his, his spirit. Okay. Is there any other song that you feel like, oh, there's like an actor that wouldn't actually maybe sing this in a similar way, but who could inspire this song? Maybe just some of the actors who played the original roles in some of the movies that then inspired. Yeah, song. I, don't know. I mean, there's that. There's yeah, there's definite ones. Like I think that um, I mean another Sweet Tooth song, but like the Werewolf song. I feel like John Goodman. Oh, That's, totally. I think of John Goodman when I think of that song. Um, yeah. 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 There's others. Happy Halloween. <laughs> the Protector. The Protector. <laughs> so many Halloween songs. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for listening or watching to my podcast. Uh, do me a favor and go to wherever you just listen to or watch this thing and subscribe or like or give us a great rating or review and then head to bpn.fm slash album to find out even more information about this podcast, more ways to watch, more ways to listen and check out my album, Album. Thanks so much for hanging out. Album Podcast is executive produced by Liz Armstrong, produced by Dory Berenstein, Alan Seals, Kim Garris, and the rest of the team at the Broadway Podcast Network. Be sure to visit bpn.fm slash album for both audio and video versions of this podcast and to listen to album.